Friends, if I have not met you yet, my name is Bailey Ray. I'm one of our directors of students here on staff, which means I get to walk along our 7th through 12th graders here at HP Prez. And one really small thing about me is that I love TV. Okay, this has been something that I have loved ever since my childhood. Maybe this is the only child in me showing. But at the end of a long day, whenever I need to decompress or just rest from a long day, I go to TV. And I've noticed that especially over the past 10 years or so, with the prevalence of streaming services like Netflix and Hulu, it's become really popular to watch an entire series of a TV show from beginning to end. And if you're one of those people that plugs into streaming services, maybe you can relate with this because I feel the incessant need that if I'm gonna sit down and watch a TV show, I have to start all the way back at the beginning with season one, episode one, and watch in chronological order. Okay, I remember the days where you just turn on the TV and whatever's on, that's what you're watching. But now that we have so much opportunity I feel this desire to sit down and watch the whole thing in order. But one of my least favorite things to hear is if someone is recommending a TV show to me and they say, Bailey, you have got to watch this TV show. It is amazing. You are going to love it. However, it's like 10 seasons long and the first two seasons are just brutal. Like, the plot is just slow, the characters are developing, and really, you just got to muscle through it. So sometimes I start these TV shows, and I'm like, it feels like this, the beginning of the show is just dragging on and on before I get to the good stuff. And if I'm honest, sometimes I feel like the Book of Romans can feel that way too. <laughs> We've been in the Book of Romans for, it seems like, a long time, and I love Romans, because it is a deep, rich, theological treatise that outlines the foundations of our faith in Christ. However, the beginning of the book seems to just beat us back and forth with how sinful we are and how broken we are. If you recall, in Romans chapters 2 and 3, Paul reminds us that we are all broken and sinful before God, Jew and Gentile alike. In Romans 5, he reminds us that because of the single sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, sin has become a curse that affects every single one of us. And even last week, Amy Orr Ewing stood up here and reminded us that there is still this prevalent temptation to submit to the master of sin, even though we have been set free from Christ. And I'll be honest this morning, as we read chapter 7, the conversation doesn't really get much lighter. We are reminded more and more of just how sinful we are. Now, if you remember, Paul, in the book of Romans, he is writing to two different groups of Christians that are fighting with each other. One group says God has given the law to his people, and yes, we place our faith in Jesus Christ, but we also have a duty to follow the commandments that God gave us in the Old Testament. And then the other group, they are Gentile Christians, and they say, no, we have been set free in Christ. We don't even need to touch the law anymore. And I think as modern Christians, we are pretty adept at figuring out what laws apply to us and what don't, such as we can follow the laws of honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself, but there are certain things that we can look at the Old Testament for and say, I don't really think that that applies to us. I'll mention this, that when Paul is speaking of the law here in Romans chapter 7, he's mainly speaking about the around 613 commandments that God gave his people in the first five books of the Old Testament. These are typically split into three categories. You've got ceremonial laws that govern the way that God's people are supposed to worship and the religious practices they're supposed to follow. There are also the ethical requirements, right, the behaviors that God's people are supposed to follow. And then finally, the civil regulations of how society is supposed to be structured. And there are so many commandments that God's people had to follow in the Old Testament. And so much of Paul's argument in the book of Romans is, hey, you have been set free from the law that once bound you. 
right? Last week in Romans chapter 6, we were taught that God's people were once slaves to the law and slaves to sin, but now we are slaves to righteousness because we have been set free in Jesus Christ. Even at the beginning of chapter 7, in verse 4, we read this. Paul says, So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. And I'll mention this this morning, that we are going to read a lot of scripture together. And I admit, it can be confusing at times. And because of that, I prefer to read this passage from the NIV, which is different than the ESV Pew Bibles in front of you. The wording just helps us understand it a little bit better to our modern ears. But all the scripture this morning is going to be on the screen. So Paul says here, hey, we have not just been divorced from the law. We have died to the law, and we now follow a new law of righteousness in Jesus Christ. However, even as 21st century modern Christians, we can still look back to the law as something that is good and beneficial to us for one particular reason, and that is because it exposes our sin for what it truly is. So this morning, let's go ahead and open up God's word together beginning to read in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Paul says this, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So this morning, the first thing that we see out of this passage is this. The law tells us that you are more sinful than you think. Ouch. You are more sinful than you think. You might have heard sin described in this way, as missing the mark, like an archer who is shooting an arrow straight towards a bullseye, and instead of hitting the center, he hits it to the right or to the left or top and bottom. And in that sense, sin is an action or a behavior that is wrong, that is unrighteous before God. But one of the things that Paul is telling us in this passage, that sin is also a force in this earth that we have to reckon with. Back to Romans 5, sin is a curse placed on both humanity and even the ground that we walk on. That's why Paul goes to such great lengths in Ephesians chapter 6 to tell us that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We do not fight a battle that is just physical. In fact, we are fighting a spiritual battle against the powers that are present on this earth and the power of sin. Even just in what we read, you'll see how Paul personifies sin. This is up on the screen, but some of the things that he says that sin does, he says that sin seized the opportunity. Sin produced covetousness in me. Sin sprang to life or came alive. Sin deceived me and put me to death. Friends, sin runs deeper than we think because it's not just something that we do, but it's something that is present and living and active inside of our fleshly nature. And Paul explains this point with the example of coveting. 
right? If you know anything about Paul, then you might know that he is a self-described Hebrew of Hebrews. He is a Pharisee, righteous before men and God. And elsewhere in the New Testament, he writes that he was able to fulfill just about all the laws that, were, were, that there were. Even if we look to the most famous of God's commandments, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, Paul can go down that list and he can say, I've done all of these things. Honor your father and mother, check. Thou shalt not steal, check. Thou shalt not murder, check. And he can go down that list feeling righteous and knowing that he is blameless before God until he gets to number 10. And number 10 says, thou shalt not covet. And what's interesting about that sin in particular is all of these other sins you can see from the outside, right? You can see that I am not lying, I am not cheating or stealing, I'm honoring my parents. But the thing about covetousness is that I can be covetous within my heart, but no one on the outside might necessarily be able to see it. Right, people can view me as this free and generous person, but on the inside, I might long for the things that other people have. I might long for the things that I just so desperately want that I think are going to fulfill me. And Paul says, through the law, our sins are identified more clearly, and we can see that our sin runs even deeper than we think. The law, in certain terms, is like a UV light in a hotel room, okay? If you have never seen one of those videos where someone goes into a hotel room, they turn off the lights, and they turn on a UV light, I'm telling you now, don't watch them because they are horrendous, all right? What that UV light does is it shows you all the gunk and germs and bodily fluids and just the mess that is left behind in hotel rooms that you don't want to see. Okay, we can all admit, hotel rooms are not going to be the cleanest place on earth, right? Someone new sleeps in this bed every single night. But if you shine a UV light in there and you can see with your naked eye just what's going on all around that room, it might make you think twice about staying in one again. And in similar terms, Paul is saying, this is what the law does to us. It reveals the sin that is, that is there, but that we might not identify on our own. And he even says, by naming that sin, for some reason there is something within our human nature that makes us want to lean into that sin and break God's law all the more. You've probably seen this at play if you have kids. Right, sometimes the worst thing that you can say to your kid, if you're trying to get them to avoid eating a cookie before dinner to spoil it, you might say, hey buddy, whatever you do, don't eat these cookies. Don't eat them. I know they're right there in the cookie jar, but don't eat them. And then your kid's thinking, well now all I want is a cookie. Right, there's something within our human nature that when we are told to not want something or not do something, we have this inclination to do it. And Paul says that the law simply reveals that nature that is already inside of us. But at the same time, Paul does not mince words about the law itself. He says the law is holy and righteous and good. I think we even forget this today in the modern church. We forget that the law is God's commands for his people so that they can live a holy and joyful life. In his book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer says this. He says, God's commands are his enablings. They show us the way we were made to live and in which blessing is to be found. Yet so often in our lives, whenever we try to follow God's commands, we always seem to fall short. So first we see that the law reveals that we as people, we are even more sinful than we think. But friends, the rest of the chapter is even more bleak because we even see how helpless we are before our sin. So let us now keep reading. This is starting in verse 12, I believe. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. 
Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now pay extra special attention to what Paul says from here on out. He says this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Friends, this morning we read that we are more sinful than we think, but also we are more helpless than we think. In this monologue, Paul goes on and on, and admittedly he repeats himself over and over, saying, regardless of what I want to do as a follower of Jesus, I just can't seem to get it right. Sin is like this ever-present opponent that I'm having to constantly fight back in my life. And as we pick apart this passage, one of the first questions that I have to ask is, how can Paul write this? Paul has already said that we are free from the law. We are free from sin. In fact, in chapter 6, verse 18, he says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Yet in chapter 7, we see this wrestling continue on and on. And what part of what Paul is trying to say is we do not submit to the master of sin anymore, but that doesn't mean that sin just goes away. In fact, both times when he repeats himself and he says, I just can't seem to get it right. What I want to do, I can't do. And what I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. He always ends with the same phrase. It's both in verse 17 and in verse 20. He says, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Remember, sin is a force. It is a power in this earth that sometimes we can't fully control. That's why the New Testament describes Satan as a prowling lion seeking someone to devour. So Paul tells us that our sin is prevalent, and yes, even as Christians, we can wrestle with this, but my second question is, how can Paul say this if he really is so firm in his faith? Is this something that we all identify with, that we can all say, yes, this adequately describes the Christian life? And admittedly, scholars go back and forth about exactly what perspective Paul is writing this from. Is it from his current fully Christian state? Is, is it from his pre-Christian state? And in coming to a conclusion there, the, the first thing that I think is, I can identify with this. Right, I believe that if you are a Christian sitting in this room or watching online, if you have even touched the robe of Jesus, I believe that this is something that we have to deal with and wrestle with, that we see God's law, we love God's commands, we love God himself, but we just can't seem to make things right. We can't always do the things that we want to do. 
In just about a week or so, we're going to have Thanksgiving, which is honestly one of my favorite holidays. I love Thanksgiving, but Thanksgiving always seems to bring out this little beast within me because I love food. And my family, we typically go all out for Thanksgiving. You know, we've got four different kinds of pies. We've got sweet potato casserole, mac and cheese, turkey, ham, everything you could ever want, right? And a rational human being would go up to the serving table and they would say, I'm going to take a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and then I'm going to be done because I don't want a tummy ache. But I am not a rational person, right? I go and I just stuff my plate as high as it can get and I sit down at the table and I enjoy this lovely food. And then I start feeling the fullness in my stomach and I say, shouldn't but I'm gonna. And I go back to the serving table and I got on more food and then someone says, hey, we haven't even broken out dessert yet and I'm like, well, of course we have to have dessert. And I kid you not, it's almost every Thanksgiving that I am sitting on the couch saying, what did I do to myself? And I am in a food coma for the rest of the day with a stomach ache. And I think even in a small way, this just reveals even in myself how even in small ways, I just can't seem to set my will up and fight against the desires of my flesh. That even when my body wants something as small as another tasty food, I can't seem to fight against that temptation and I do what goes against what my body actually needs. And again, this is just a small example, but if you are a believer, I think that this is something that we deeply wrestle with in a lot of ways. That there are certain habits we pick up or certain things that we try to self-medicate with in our lives, whether it be alcohol or whether it be success or power or money or pornography, and the list goes on and on, that there are things in our lives that we think we have the willpower to overcome, but when push comes to shove and we need to put those things aside for the sake of our holiness and well-being, we just can't seem to do it. And as Christians, even though we have the power of God within us, we continue to struggle and struggle with sin in our lives. And what Paul is saying in this passage is that we cannot fix this problem alone. The law, yes, it reveals our sin, which is a great thing so that we can tackle it. But here's the thing, the law can't do anything about our sin. I like this picture that John Calvin provides in Institutes. He says, the law is like a mirror that shows us the dirt on our face, but it has no power to cleanse us. So here's the thing, I do believe that we struggle with this as Christians, even in the modern 21st century. However, I don't think that this is a complete picture of the Christian life. Because as Paul paints this struggle, he paints it as a battle between our renewed minds and hearts and our unrenewed flesh. But one thing that he has not mentioned yet is the Holy Spirit. And to that, we have to look to chapter 8. Paul finishes chapter 7 and goes on to chapter 8 to say this. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, and he says this as a summary of all he said so far, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Friends, there is no freedom from our sin apart from the liberating power of the Holy Spirit. I really like the way John Stott in his commentary on Romans summarizes this passage. He says, surely this is the conflict of a regenerate person who knows, loves, chooses, and longs for God's law, but finds that by himself he cannot do it. His whole being, especially his mind and will, is set upon God's law. He wants to obey it, and when he sins, it is against his reason, his desire, his consent. 
but the law cannot help him. Only the power of the indwelling spirit could change things. So friends, we find ourselves in this constant struggle between our hearts and minds that want to follow after God, but admittedly we live in bodies of flesh that hold us back and do not let us pursue holiness as God desires for us in our lives. However, the book of Romans points us to the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us everything that we need. At the beginning of the service, I love that Sterling read from the book of Matthew where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weak and weary, and I will give you rest. My yoke is light and my burden is easy. Friends, when we try to fight our own sin, it's a losing battle. We are going to lose 10 times out of 10. And quite frankly, it's a healthy thing to be able to acknowledge that I am not okay, that I am sinful, and that there is something within me that is pushing against the sanctification that God wants in my life. But while admitting that is the first step, pursuing righteousness or more fully, opening yourself up to the Holy Spirit is the only way in which we will be able to find freedom. So here's the challenge this morning. Where do you find this struggle? Where do you find yourself most often finding this path that you keep going back to of serving the flesh, of giving into sin, of not wanting to give up certain addictions or certain bad habits, what does that look like in your life? And then how would that look for you to simply be open-handed to what the Spirit wants to do in you? And of course, this can follow through in so many different ways. But my encouragement to you is first find community, people that you can walk with and admit this sin, and then invite the Holy Spirit both as a community and as an individual. Friends, we get the opportunity to ask the Spirit for strength. We can lean on those around us. And in our struggle with sin, we know this, that we do not fight it alone. Pray with me this morning. God, we first confess that we are sinful. God, we are more sinful and more helpless than we even think. But God, we trust that there is redemption through Jesus Christ and there is strength in the Holy Spirit. So this morning, whatever looks, whatever that looks like, in each and every one of our individual lives, God, would you simply bring that to mind this morning? And would you push us to take one step this week to counteract that sin? God, remind us that it is not willpower, that it is not rolling up our sleeves and fighting harder. It is simply opening up our hands to the strength that you want to provide for us. God, when we want to fight the hardest, would we release the most to you? And God, we thank you that you are faithful in every situation to provide your presence and your strength. God, we love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.